the first question I had for you, gentlemen, um, was about where we are in the cycle at the moment. So generally, royalty and streaming businesses are at their busiest when the cycle's at its lowest point. Based on your activity at the moment, where would you put us? Anyone? EB? Well, I think things are about to get very exciting. We, we put Metal together in November of 2016, so we're 30 months into this. We've bought 45 uh, royalties, all third-party acquisitions. We keep a, a finger on the pulse of what's going on in the sector. Now, as you alluded, when things start getting better, we start getting depressed because, because you know what's coming. What's coming is, I mean, the gold's up. I just checked another $16 in the spot market right now. It's 14 dollars So, I mean, it's, it's making a move. I mean, gold looks to me like <coughs> 1982 for equities. Okay, so 1982, no one wanted to buy equities. You know, everything else had run. Equities hadn't. Gold set out private equity, it set out VC, it set out all these bubbles that we've made. Okay, so this is all starting to happen. So I think we're, we're now at the point where things get very interesting. Uh, the three of us have to get creative because um, uh, it's, been, it's been fun the last couple of years. And I think our experience is very different to the other two on the panel because we are not in the pressure space. Um, and outside precious, things continue to be very difficult. There's a complete dearth of you know, public equity investment. There's very little private equity. There's the whole bank funding. So we continue to see extraordinary levels of demand for alternative financing. Um, you know, globally, uh, projects which normally would have been funded uh, at a bankable feasibility stage are struggling to get financing. So I think there are definitely, you know, the royalty market is a complex world and there are different parts to it. And um, some will be, uh, you know, more buoyant with, with gold and there will be alternative financing alt uh, available. But for us, um, not in that space. Uh, it continues to be a time of opportunity. I would say over the last 12 to 24 months, what we've seen is deleveraging by a lot of different larger producers. We've seen recapitalization by a lot of those producers. I would say that has been, that was actually the bottom of the market. Uh, not unlike my colleague over there who says that we're probably in a very exciting time. I agree with that. I actually think we're in a growth phase right now. And based on the opportunities that we're actually seeing in this growth phase, we're seeing development stage projects trying to get funding. We're seeing exploration stage projects trying to move to the next stage. Uh, we're seeing expansions at existing operations. So, so we see as streamers and royalty companies, we see an opportunity to capitalize on those by coming in and providing that, that source of funding. And I'm sure we'll talk about the various sources of funding available out there. But yeah, no, we're, we're very excited. We think we are in a growth phase right now. Is there a difference between royalties versus a stream at this point? Is one better than an the other at a certain point in the market? Depends who you ask, I guess. Well, I'm asking you. Sure, so from a, from a stream perspective, the reason that streaming has taken off so much since, <coughs> our, since we created streaming in 2004 is because a stream can be structured tax efficiently. And so you can come up with a similar value or a greater value than what a royalty can provide, but you also get that downstream payment at the time of production, which is designed to cover the cost to produce and deliver an ounce of silver or gold. So from that perspective, you know, that's why you see some of the larger competitors as well. Also, the majority of their transactions, if not all of them, are now streaming. Mm -hmm. and so that's, you know, I'd say definitely there's an advantage to streaming. Doesn't mean that their the royalties are can't make us make a, a, a continued progression here, but it, they'll likely be tailored more towards the smaller opportunities. And, and for for people that are that are totally outside of the industry, just to clarify and <clears throat> correct me if I'm misspeak here, but the stream, what's unique is you're buying the ounce of silver for say five bucks and then selling it on the market immediately and capturing the $10 spread. So you have a buy and a sell, so you have an operating profit. Whereas with the royalty, you just have say 1% of everything that's produced. And you do tend to run into issues with private, I mean a, a passive investment status that, that can happen with, with royalties. So, so that's one of the, you say, are they, is one better than the other? Not really, it's just that there, there is a, a stark difference between the tax treatment and kind of the accounting treatment of the two, of the two assets, although they, in theory, do about the same thing. Yeah, I mean, we do both, but obviously yeah. the tax treatment varies from country to country. I think the interesting thing about a royalty, though, is our um, revenues translate almost entirely into free cash flow. Um, whereas when you have a stream, you still have to make the um, underlying payment for the commodity. So there is a 
more leverage on the streaming side. Definitely. I, I, I would just add, so they're both right. There is a production payment that comes at the time that, that a ro uh, a announce is delivered. But, and I, I would state nothing that my colleagues here have said is incorrect, but what it, the way the streams are now being structured, they're designed now, we've, we've evolved into a percentage of spot production payment. So as commodity prices rise, typically the counterparty has higher taxes. When you have a percentage of spot production payment, your costs go up, my costs will go up, but that additional cost will offset some of the costs that the counterparty has to cover from a tax perspective. So, so it, 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 I'm seeing a lot of counterparties a lot more favorable to this new structure because, you know, whereas a royalty doesn't cover some of that. Well, that's not true, actually, a royalty covers their tax, but whereas historically the old streaming structure doesn't cover the tax, this one will cover the additional tax that will have to be paid. Okay. We did some research toward the back of last year that showed that the deal volumes for that 12 months, um, the deal volumes were up about 100% on the previous year, um, but the deal value, the aggregated deal value, was down about 75%. Just wondering if that makes sense to you guys, if that, or if that surprises you. I think there was a period when uh, the majors did very significant royalty deals, uh, which really moved the needle for them. And then once their finances improved, they didn't have to do that anymore. And that may have distorted the um, value numbers for a number of years. And then once that had washed through the system, things returned to a different normality. So I think that that's the explanation for that. But overall, uh, in a world where alternative sources of financing are increasingly difficult, we definitely see uh, increasing mainstream need and acceptance of the role of royalties um, within the financing of, of a sector which is very capital intensive. So, so one thing Metalla did that was very <coughs> different was we figured out that there were hundreds upon hundreds of royalties sitting out there that people just owned them for 10, 20, 30 years. Like someone discovered something, kept a royalty and never did anything with it. And maybe the, they were getting older or something was happening in their life. They wanted to sell that. So we, we looked at this business and we said, look, it's really difficult. What these guys do is hard because you're financing a project and it's a, it's, it, you can't get away from it being a bit contentious because one party's taking on an obligation and you know, it's, it's, it's tough. Um, and, and, it, and it's a different kind of process. And so what, what we decided to do was to go into the third party market and shop amongst these hundreds of royalties sitting up on a shelf and say, well, which one of these do we want? And then which one of these sellers can we prove that we are a responsible company and they take stock you know, and be our partners, right? So, so while your, your stats are correct on the, on the, the deals, I mean, it was, it was an indication of where we are in the cycle. However, we were doing something totally different. You know, we, we just went off on our own course with, with this premise, and it turns out that the premise, you know, we're 60% compounded average growth rate, the premise is work. Okay. Yeah. So you see, an, you see opportunities arise, especially on the streaming and royalty side, when commodity prices are depressed. So what we saw over the last 24 months was a rise in, you know, copper, lead, not so much, but zinc, definitely. Nickel prices went up a little bit. So, you know, when that happens, uh, you, there's, there's a, a general lack of need or desire to raise capital because you typically have access to, to the equity markets or the debt markets at reasonable rates. Well, what we're actually seeing now is in this growth phase that we see, you know, commodity prices are coming back off, copper sitting at 270, lead's at 86 cents. Zinc is, you know, it's come off its highs of 130 something to now 115, call it 116. So we're seeing a lot of projects that require this higher upfront capital cost, not able to raise the money, and the internal rates of return of these projects don't look great because of this significant upfront capital that you need. And typically these projects don't have this high grade core that they can get their payback from right away. So that's where streaming or royalty companies can come in and actually provide that capital upfront and, and keep in mind, a stream always improves the internal rate of return of project because of that initial capital infusion. So we are seeing more opportunities, but they're smaller opportunities, as you said. But you know, I'd say I'm seeing double the number of opportunities, if not triple the number of opportunities I was seeing before. But you know, they're not billion dollar deals anymore. They're 100 to 300 million dollar deals. I might partly answer the next question. Um, I was going to, it sounds like incorrectly assume that the fact that no one spent any money on exploration for the past decade and no one's found many things of a meaningful scale for probably much longer than that, that financing groups in the royalties and streaming space will be finding it tough to locate good deals or investment grade deals. 
you're, you're not having any issues finding, finding deals, obviously maybe not for EB given it's third party. So, so we look at a lot of opportunities, but you know, for every 40, 30 or 40 opportunities we look at, we're lucky if we get one. So I can tell you, we look at probably, you know, in this environment, historically it was between 40 and 50 opportunities a year. We're probably double that now. And if I can walk away with one or two high quality assets, that would be great. And keep in mind, Wheaton's structure is a little bit different. We're not looking for assets that give us leverage to movements in the commodity price by because they're higher cost and they generate more, more of an impact at that way. What we're looking for is assets that fall into the lowest half of the cost curve, assets that provide that expiration growth, that, that have a solid management team, that have not necessarily a uh, high risk jurisdiction, but lower politically risky jurisdictions, and that offer consistent, safe returns longer term. You may not have the same leverage uh, in a rising commodity price environment, but you provide the ability for investors to come in into a safe investment and knowing that they're generating strong cash flows. And you're seeing, you're seeing a reasonably significant volume oh, of oh yeah. deals that meet that grade. Well, no, we're seeing a reasonably significant volume of deals. Only probably 5% of them make that grade. Yeah, I mean, last year we looked at 300 deals yeah. and we did two. Yeah. Um, so, you know, there are very high hurdles to putting your money to work. Uh, but this is a good environment for what we call primary royalties, where miners need money. And then the through cycle opportunity of second hand or secondary royalties is there all the time because, particularly if they're not gold and silver, they're quite illiquid. Um, and the ability to monetize those in a public vehicle, I think, is very valuable. So, so this is a business that's not going anywhere. It's here to stay. It's a permanent feature, uh, and it's just going to become more uh, mainstream. Does it not have to evolve with uh, mining safe havens becoming more mature, with companies moving into more exotic locations? Uh, do raw team streaming groups not need to move with the industry and start lowering some of those hurdles? Well, I mean, the perverse uh, outcome of the ESG regulations is that we all get penalized for going into countries which may need uh, additional mining and improvement. So unfortunately, um, to the extent we want to still attract ESG funding, um, you know, we need to stick to safer jurisdictions. It's not necessarily a good outcome, but it's a reality of the uh, current state of affairs. So we, we, we have chosen to focus exclusively on gold and silver because that's what we know, that's where our background is, and that's where we think we can get the biggest lift. I mean, we think that the gold and silver royalties as a package, you know, if you get dozens of these things together that are the size that we're buying with strong counterparties, can trade at, say, one and a half times net asset value. So if we're trading at 0.5 times in asset value, it's a compelling proposition to sellers to come in and take some stock. It's a compelling proposition to investors because you're catching this big move. And if you combine that with, say, $1,500 gold, I mean, we're not talking 3000 you, you would not believe what the stock price will do. You know, and so one thing we do that's different in Metalla is we pay a monthly dividend. You know, we pay half of operating cash flow out monthly to shareholders. Believe it or not, some Europeans don't like dividends. They, they complain about the tax treatment. However, we think it's philosophically important to pay shareholders money, even if it's not tax advantaged, because they own the company. And so their return should grow with the company in valuation and from a cash perspective. So the way you'll see us go through this cycle, which what we're calling is, is correct, is, is that we'll build the largest pipeline of gold and silver ounce flow that we can possibly build and capture the full extent of this move, which I think is right on the horizon. So I, the only thing I would add is the key to going into higher risk jurisdictions is risk adjusting them appropriately in your valuations when you're, when you're purchasing those assets. You know, we, we have, you know, 19 operating assets in our under streaming agreements right now, and they generate close to $600 million a year. Some of our larger competitors have you know, f close to 400 different assets, which generate a fraction of that. So it, it's not, about, for us, it's not about, uh, you know, where it is. It's how do we manage risk? Can we get security? Can we get a corporate guarantee? What does a corporate guarantee mean if you're getting it from a, co a company within that country? Can you get security outside the country? And, and all structure is almost just as important as the quality of the transaction, because if you have a, a structure that doesn't work, that doesn't protect you, and that's key for us, is having that protection, then you really shouldn't be getting into that uh, transaction, regardless of what the margins are. I mean, there's assets in Russia, for example, that are phenomenal assets. Will we go into Russia anytime soon? No. 
because we can't get comfortable that if something went wrong, if the law suddenly changed, you know, the oligarchs decide to, to rally for a change in the law to outlaw streaming, suddenly our you know, $500 million investment would be gone. So we're very cautious to, to structure things the right way. This is, this is right on. I mean, we, we, case in point, have a stream on a silver mine in Tanzania, and we've gotten paid on that stream at the full pro forma rate right through the problems in Tanzania, mm -hmm. while the mining company has been dinged significantly. So it is all about how you structure the deal, how you choose to, to, to create the leverage that you need to be able to secure that cash flow. I mean, we just don't go to those places. <laughs> That's the easiest. <laughs> like talking about structure, we hear quite a lot about the capital structure of a, uh, of a development financing these days. Um, one of the big problems that um, people have brought up with royalty and streaming um, as having too much of the capital structure um, is that it's a, a loss for the equity investors. I was interested in your views on what a good capital structure is. Um, and whether it's important for royalty and streaming firms to have that support from A, traditional debt finance, and B, the equity markets in terms of making sure that the assets and the companies that you're investing in remain solvent. Sure, maybe I'll, I'll start. I can say that the, there, is, there is no perfect structure. What I can say is every single chief financial officer where they're looking at ways to raise capital for their organizations, are now considering streaming or royalties as a third source of financing next to debt and equity. Uh, what we've gone is a little different. So when we first started, well not when we first started, probably about eight years ago, we recognized that there was some depressed commodity prices on, on the junior exploration companies, et cetera, the ones that have that, those development stage projects coming in. And we looked and said, okay, if we're gonna try and help these companies by, giving them, by, by taking equity and giving them capital, that's gonna dilute them much too much. And that's not gonna be an attractive source of funding. So what we did is develop a new structure we call the early deposit structure. In that structure, as long as there's some kind of scoping study or technical report, or we can put some economics to it. We will come up, let's say as a rough example, let's say we come up with a, with a NPV value for a stream worth 100 million. We'll give them anywhere between, you know, call it five to $10 million of that upfront at no dilution. We don't want equity back for that. So what, we, what that gives us is the option down the road on that, the remainder of, uh, of the capital when the, they make a decision to move forward with a full feasibility study. So that, from our perspective, helps the company because it helps them advance it through whether it's the feasibility through to the development or PFS to FS without dilution, which, you know, when you're talking some of these companies are, are suffering with market caps that used to be 200 that are now 20 or 10, you know, that, that's a good way to, to help them advance the project. And, and we're both incentivized because we will not want a stream to be existing on an asset if the margins aren't there because the worst thing I could do is do a stream on a low margin asset and have that, a that asset shut down or not developed because the first thing they're gonna say is the stream existence, the stream's existence killed the development of that asset. So, you know, that's, reputation is huge. So even though I may get an NPV of 100 million, stock will drop, you know, 50 cents or a dollar and suddenly I'm down 400 million in market cap. So you have to weigh that, definitely. I absolutely think you know, ultimately any investment in mining is really an equity investment with volatility. Um, even debt has equity type risks and you know, they're often binary outcomes. So we are ultimately more aligned with the equity holders than anybody else in making sure that the sizing of any financial commitment is appropriate to the asset. The last thing we want is for there to be financial issues where the uh, mine stops producing for whatever reason. Um, and so I think the royalty in the stream structure is a wonderful hybrid structure. It's less dilutive than equity. The returns we require are much lower. Um, and it provides more leverage uh, to the uh, underlying owners of the business. Um, and in, in, you know, in the royalty case, not in the streaming case, uh, you don't even have to pay it back if something uh, goes wrong. So I think it is a very neat vehicle which really has its place. We've tried to, to mitigate this by buying strong counterparty royalties, Pan American, Agnico, Newmont Gold Corp. You know, we've, we've, we've tried to stay away from the juniors because what these guys are saying is accurate. You know, you, it's a very important consideration. And so we've said, well, let's let someone else fight that battle and let's go with people that even in the depths of the worst market still can operate and they're, you know, Ignico, for example, is ROI driven firm and they're just not going to dig a hole unless the, the numbers support it. And so we've, we've decided to focus on 
companies like that to be the operating companies. Again, if we're staying away from the juniors that are risky and we're staying away from um, risky jurisdictions and equity markets that will support um, exploration companies are inactive, don't royalty companies, particularly those ones that are relying on development um, deals, don't they risk that pipeline, that cupboard becoming bare if nothing's coming through? Don't you have to go, don't you have to go uh, upstream and start taking a few risks? I mean, we do uh, take risks. I mean, we put small amounts of money into very long, large, long-dated development opportunities. Anglo-Pacific was built upon a royalty which they paid $250,000 for. It's going to produce $600 million in income. So we look for some of those. And then we are also interested in um, helping to fund uh, the construction of projects because that seems to us to be the area of the market at the moment that's most constrained in terms of financing, but we try and do so on a sort of milestone basis so that we put more money to work as the project gets de-risked. And then, and then we, there are always companies that need to deleverage or want to build another mine who have production. Um, and, um, and so it's uh, important to have a variety of uh, different stage projects in your portfolio. But ultimately, this is a capital intensive sector and there's not much money and fortunately, we have capital, and so we can choose and be picky. So for, just, just to add, as a streaming company, we recognize that the only way we'll be competitive is if we evolve. So, so as I mentioned earlier, we developed this early deposit structure, which helps these development stage opportunities. But we also, as of late, have looked at opportunities where we've looked at putting in uh, the stream, but as well providing some form of convert or some type of debt and some form of equity. But you know, we avoid the equity because, one, we don't want to over-dilute them. We'll only do the equity if they want the equity. Uh, if they come to us and say, listen, thank you for the stream, thank you for the 20 million debt, whatever it happens to be, uh, the equity, we kind of need $3 million to continue drilling this thing. Well, you know what, we're investing for a reason. We're investing to see this, this asset progress going forward. Now, that being said, I don't think streaming or royalty companies should be putting in large amounts of debt. The reason people invest in streaming companies and royalty companies is because we provide a low-risk uh, exposure to the commodity. And once you, you're putting in significant debt into a company, into an organization, you're taking away that low risk. So I don't mind doing it on a small basis, but on a large basis, I'll leave that to the banks. Okay. And just in terms of evolution, of course, there is mm -hmm. the development of the buyback feature, right. which uh, I think has become more um, standard over time. Which is terrible. We don't, we don't use buybacks at all. Yeah, you don't. Yeah. Uh, but, but that is something which can provide some more uh, optionality to the, uh, to the vendor. To the counterparty. Yeah. But to the streamer itself, because institutional investors, retail investors are putting money in and they're putting it in at a growth multiple that's well above the net asset value. So what they're buying is that multiple and you're getting that multiple because you have exposure to that long-term growth. If we take that away, our multiple will start to contract over time. So I think it's a huge mistake to offer the buybacks. Mm -hmm. I don't see any issue operate, offering some drop downs. Yes. I think that's very reasonable as long as it's priced in at the time the transaction is done. So Analysts and fund managers and anybody who wants to invest can actually price that into their calculation. But if you have a potential buyback uh, for an asset, and I don't want to use any names, that they can come in and acquire it at a 10% IRR or 15% IRR, it's very difficult for analysts and institutional investors to give you more value than what the value of that buyback is. So that's one of the reasons we do avoid them. For, for us, um, we, we decided early on, I mean, I think I mentioned earlier this morning that Brett and I created the company we could never find in the public markets, and it was basically the way for the average shareholder to capture a move, you know, without operational risk. And so we watched um, another up-and-coming royalty company that's not here, of course, get a bunch of small deals done and then do a huge deal and then run into big operational problems, and then that taxed the excellent small deals that they did. And while they're very smart guys and everything is gonna ultimately be okay, it was a big headache for average shareholders. And so for us, we, we felt like this was the 80-20 rule. You know, we can get 80% of the, of the carry uh, without getting involved in that, in that operational side of the business. And so that's why we've, we've focused on these, these assets with strong counterparties and we don't wanna be involved in, in arranging things. While what these guys are saying is right, it's exactly right. It's exactly what you need to do if you want to be involved in that. We, we've chosen 
uh, rightly or wrongly, we've chosen to build this as a, as a way to, to catch that move in gold and silver and not get bogged down in the, in the operations. Quite lucky we've got um, a junior third party only royalty group. We've got, I think, the world's only uh, non precious metals global royalties. Yes. <laughs> yeah, um, and a major, I think, the, the father of, of streaming mm -hmm. uh, potentially. Um, how would, if you're an investor looking at what kind of royalty streaming firm you want exposure to, how would you individually you know, differentiate yourselves and why, why would that be the best model to follow? Or are they, are they different for different types of investors? Maybe starting it. Start well, at okay, so, so this, is, this is a good question because it depends on your, your philosophy. I mean, we don't want a job. So we didn't create Metalla to have a long-term employment tenure uh, at a small office in Vancouver. You know, we created this to build something. And then where will that go? Well, we'll, we'll see. Okay, we'll build it as long as we can build it. I'm gonna assume that it, as gold rises, our deal pipeline becomes, becomes constricted a bit because it's, that's typically how things work. So how many royalties can we buy before that happens? Now, I've bought a lot of stock in this company, what I consider to be a lot. I bought stock Friday, I've bought almost once a week the whole time. I've been involved with the company. So, I mean, I, I continue to be a big buyer of my own stock. Well, there's a reason why. And it's not to collect the stock. I mean, I'm buying it because I don't know of a better way that I can capture that move. And so, like I was saying earlier, we're 60% compounded average growth rate since we went public. Where else am I gonna get a 60% compounded growth rate with a monthly dividend? Where else am I gonna get that? I mean, I, I, I'm not, my desk is not full of those types of opportunities, especially in a down gold market. So that's why we've chosen, there's probably other ways to, to, to make money, but that's why we've chosen this one and we've gone all in on this one. Um, I, I think from an Anglo-Pacific perspective, you know, as the only non-precious global royalty company, we don't have much competition. Uh, we seek returns uh, from 8% up to 25% on our, our royalties, and that allows us to be both a significant growth company. So we've also, since when I joined the company five years ago, we had income of three million. This year we'll be over 60 million pounds. Um, and we also provide a very high dividend, you know, 5% yield roughly, which is two and a half times covered. So you don't have to compromise between growth and income, you get both, plus um, a much less competitive environment where we can scale since 85% uh, of the mining sector is in gold and silver. So, so we are a pure precious metals producer. So when investors are looking what to invest in, when they're looking at whether to buy bullion, whether to buy an ETF, or whether to buy Wheaton, you know, we give them that alternative, but we also provide them something that those things don't give. We give them organic growth through our existing operations that we have streams on. Because we enter into life of mine agreements, we give them a dividend and we pay 30% uh, dividend average over the last four quarters, but we, may, we, went, we went one step further. To reduce the volatility, we put a bottom on it. So at a minimum, we'll pay nine cents a share per quarter dividend. Uh, that gives investors the, the exposure, but it also gives them the flexibility. Our yield is not 5%, we're at 2% yield, but you know, our, over time, we're gonna grow that to, from 30% of operating cash flows as dividended out to 40 and to 50. Right now, we generate close to 600 million a year in free cash flow. My job is to make sure we have no money left at the end of every year, but to make sure that that money is spent accretively. So I will not do a transaction in which it is not accretive. We're not looking to grow for the sake of growth. We went two years, almost two and a half years without doing a deal because commodity prices had risen so far that the expectations on the counterparty was that we were gonna pay, this is when silver was $49, that we were gonna pay 40 to $45 an ounce. We refused to do that, and we knew it was a bit of a blip. So, you know, we we are very, very careful in how we deploy our capital because we are we're working with our shareholders' money. We've got five or six minutes for questions, Rod. Uh, in the first place, just to correct E. B. Tucker, the complaint about dividends paid to European shareholders was not about the payment of dividends, it was about the facility for dividend reinvestment, it's which other yeah. companies have got. Yeah. And I which think, we have, yeah. And I yeah. think that the dividend paid out by royalty companies is one of the biggest attractions in the mining market today. But the point that's concerning me as a veteran royalty investor 
is what Hayton was saying, is he's very disciplined in his approach. And I think all attendees should be aware that one of the big values of royalty companies, whether it be Franco, whether it be Wheaton or Metalla or Anglo-Pacific, is their research departments. The research that these people provide on projects before they invest is the best in the industry. It's a lot better than mining companies making these decisions themselves. But the point is that now we are up $75 on the gold price and a dollar on the silver price, which makes a very material invest uh, decision for the owner of the royalties looking ahead. So Hayton, if you are in a situation where you are disciplined as to the basis of your investments and you are restricted in terms of the jurisdictions you can look at, how can you maintain the growth in that royalty portfolio that you've seen over the last five years? Well, that's, I mean, that's a very, very good question. So it all depends on where you are in the cycle. There are periods of time where we're investing a billion dollars a year. On average, we've invested $7 billion in the last seven years into streaming transactions. But there are also periods of time where, whereby, as a question that, that Chris asked earlier, you know, what about these junior exploration and development stage opportunities? If you do your due diligence, and, and everything we do is done internally, we've got mining engineers, geologists, uh, process engineers, geological engineers, so if you do your due diligence and you can assess one of these earlier stage projects, whether it's at the expiration or the pre-fees or scoping study stage, and invest into that, you can actually get a, a much better return for a much smaller investment because there's that additional risk that you take on. So, so yes, we're looking to deploy capital, but no, it's not at any cost. I don't have to maintain a billion dollar a year run rate. Right now we have a billion dollars in debt on a two billion revolver, which is two years worth of cash flows. I'll use that cash flow to repay my debt if I have to. If I can't find assets that are accretive for my investors, why wouldn't I improve the balance sheet for my investors? And that, that's how we look at it going forward. Yeah, but the issue I see it as looking ahead for the royalty companies. Franco here has got a billion a year to invest. Wheaton's got a billion a year to invest. Okay, so is this being invested consistently in gold and silver royalties? I don't think that the royalty companies are going to be able to maintain the same momentum that they've had over the last five years, over the next five years, of higher metal prices. But the whole mining sector is going to be transformed at higher metal prices, and the royalty companies are going to be safer. But aren't you going to have to change the assumptions? Aren't you going to have to start looking at other parts of Africa or Eurasia? Who's doing anything in Eurasia, where all the growth is? And of course, there's a possibility of dealing in Russia. See, see what's inevitable is the fact that as commodity prices rise, people will look at acquiring, consolidation, et cetera. They will look at building higher cost projects that have higher capital. So the companies will start to, start to leverage themselves up again. So we're, this is all a cycle, right? It's gonna come and it's gonna, it's gonna go. There are times where we're going to be able to deploy capital, and there are times when we're not going to be able to deploy capital efficiently. But, you know, it, it, is, it is just as sure as day becomes night and night becomes day, you'll see the companies over leverage themselves and look at M&A that drives them, guaranteed. And that will create opportunities for all of us here. Uh, we, we think one area that, that gets very interesting is down at the three, four million ounce of proven deposit range. I mean, you, you know, so we've, as you probably know, we've bought assets in friendly jurisdictions that are right in that size. And that's been a strategic move because we felt like, well, if there's grade, price goes up and it's in, you know, Canada, that'll probably get developed. And so that, that'll give us an additional boost as that happens. As for the dividend reinvestment, I, I can say this here, we can't press release it, but we filed a 40F with the SEC, um, and you can look that up on Edgar, which is the SEC search website. And I, I, as an investor, I would wanna keep track of that because you can track that progress while the company can't press release it because uh, it's considered promotional <coughs> that's happening. And once we are listed there, then the drip will begin and uh, we will eliminate yet another uh, cause for concern, so. And perhaps the final word for me, we don't do gold and silver because there's a big world out there. But I think these guys have scaled very successfully. They have tremendously high ratings. 
Uh, the flip side of that is it's difficult for them to move out of the gilded cage. But, um, you know, there's swings and roundabouts for all strategies. And uh, in, a, in an increasingly uncertain world, people will value gold and silver and the insurance that's provided mm -hmm. by it. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.